Cool. Uh, thank you very much. Um, yeah, Richard Law, I'm a GIS analyst and developer at Munaki Whenua Lanke Research. Um, this presentation is called Land Use Mapping Street Global Grid System, but I won't be talking much about land use mapping as a practice, but if you're interested in that, um, please feel free to talk to me today or some other day during the week. Rather, I'm going to be focusing primarily on what a discrete global grid system or a DGGS is at, at a high level. I'll demonstrate that it's sort of a halfway point between the prevailing raster and vector data types or data models. I'll introduce some open source tools that we've released uh, that can help you get your feet wet with DGGS. And I'll explain uh, some of the opinions these tools, um, in particular, um, how they use an output format that is column-oriented rather than row-oriented, and I'll explain what those terms mean. But I, I will briefly demonstrate um, a regional land use map that we've made using these ideas and tools to sort of show you that it is, it is practical. Cool, so taking you back to your days maybe in, in GIS 101, you spent some time studying GIS, learning about it, maybe you spent some time with with lo-fi beats to relax slash study to, if my pop culture references aren't too out of date. Uh, you learned you about the idea of raster and vector data types, and you, you know, raster is raster, vector is raster, and raster, vector is vector, and never the twain shall meet. You probably understand intuitively that vector is good for objects, things that can intersect, things that can be adjacent to each other, things that have a topology. They can contain all kinds of useful attributes um, of different data types. You also know what a raster is. You can maybe translate grids and resample like the best of them. Maybe you can compress your data, get a bit fancy with a cloud-optimized geotiff. Perhaps you've involved yourself in the Australian Geoscience Data Cube idea, which is great if you have, because you'll have an intuitive understanding of the benefits of spatially aligning data and making things analysis ready. But now you've been tasked with making a map that requires you to build a bridge over that raster vector dichotomy. And a land use map is a great example. So you need to identify land that is suitable for, uh, that is, sorry, that is used for high productivity dairy farms. The definition of this might be um, that the topography is flat, that there's adequate rainfall, uh, and the land cover is primarily grassland. But that's, that's a map of potential use, of things that's compatible with dairy land, but that's not actual use. So in combination of that um, somewhat static physical information, uh, usually given as raster, you need some information that's in the, the realm of human geography. You probably need to know where there are dairy effluent consents. Uh, you'll need to know farm boundaries, stock numbers, possibly revenue and profit. These are not things that are available via remote sensing. They're essentially, essentially declarative, and they're available typically as vector data since they map to property or perhaps paddock boundaries. So to approach this problem, you might start by aligning the raster data onto the same grid, and the cost of that might be some loss of information as you put them onto that grid and you resample, but not too bad. But that doesn't get you any closer to bringing in that vector data. So how do you handle the vectors? If you're lucky, there's a common attribute, like a parcel ID, on which you could do an attribute join and have a uniform spatial reference like a parcel. But if you're unlucky, or perhaps if the problem is just different than this example, you're probably not gonna have a good time. Vector geospatial data is made at different scales for different purposes, and there are always severe alignment issues when combining multiple polygons, um, polygon layers, and the boundaries between features don't align even when they are clearly attempts to put a boundary at the edge of some kind of real-world feature like a forest or a river. So you might rasterize the vector data, but that typically comes at a cost of losing the rich data types and these attributes, and it struggles to handle the case of overlapping boundaries, such as farmers leasing land from their neighbors. However you approach this problem, let's say you do it after some time and you manage to combine these, all these data and produce a land use map. Good job. And then you're about to finish for the week and one of your six bosses comes to you and asks you to add in some new layers that the client's only just given to you. Easy, right? Well, particularly if you're working in the vector space, each time you add an additional layer, you potentially exponentially compound the topology issues that you worked hard to resolve. Additional raster is definitely easy to handle, but in reality for a land use map, a lot of the data is appropriately modeled by vector data. It's property information, it's consents, things that overlap, it's text fields that can be searched, it's attributes that identify confidence and recency and therefore benefit from dynamic filtering. 
wouldn't it be great if extending, uh, if, it, if extending such an exercise and overlaying data was easier? Something like raster algebra, where they're having to go all in on the raster train. Land use mapping as a practice has really brought home to me how fundamental this division between the raster and vector data models is. So I think it's worth thinking about. Is there a better way? In the mid-2010s, there was an American company called Juicero. Juicero designed, manufactured, and sold a product called the Juicero Press, a fruit and vegetable pouring device. The Juicero Press featured Wi-Fi connectivity and used proprietary single-serve packets of pre-chopped fruits and veggies that were sold exclusively by Juicero on a subscription basis. From 2014 to 2017, the San Fran-based firm received 120 million US dollars in startup venture capital. Things went downhill. The company attracted significant negative media attention when consumers and journalists discovered that its proprietary juice packets could be squeezed just as easily by hand as by the company's expensive juicer. So in 2017, following slow sales, surprisingly, the company ceased operations and announced it was seeking a buyer for the company and its intellectual property. This is a, uh, an image of a disassembled Juicero press. Remember, this is a machine that made juice just as effectively as your hands and cost several hundred US dollars while locking you into a subscription model for buying fruit and vegetables. Sounds like a nightmare. <laughs> I've been to this conference before and I've made, frankly, a presentation about DGGS and I'll explain more about it in a moment, but I've been spruiking this idea for a while and, and I claim fundamentally that a DGGS is a hybrid data model between raster and vector. But am I just complicating things? Is the idea of a DGGS like a, like a Juicero press? Well, maybe, but I think to be specific, the Juicero press is a bit like what three words. That is, it was one, one, what three words, one attempt at making a system of tessellated, discrete, addressable cells that covers the whole world. It was perhaps mildly useful for voice communication over radio, and yes, probably useful for addresses for placed at lack addressing systems. Apparently it's still used by the British emergency services because they get it to use it for free, but it is still proprietary, and honestly it hasn't taken off like people claimed it would. The company has made losses in the tens of millions of, of pounds for each of the past six years, and what three words was famously very irritated and litigious when a geospatial developer reverse engineered it and made an open spoof of exactly the same idea using nothing but what my Irish nana liked to call foul language. <laughs> and I was, I was going to show you what the what three F's address was for this venue, but I'm afraid she'll probably haunt me. <laughs> so a DGGS is similar to, but quite distinct from, what three words. The idea of a system of discrete cells that cover the whole world without any gaps is still the same, but it expands on the concept, and also it's not proprietary. There's more than one implementation. Varieties exist using squares, triangles, and hexagons. It has more than three levels. Uh, there's an OGC abstract specification for DGGSs, which even considers more than two dimensions. There is an OGC API standard for accessing data available in a DGGS over the web. So again, I think the best way to think about this is, uh, is a hybrid raster vector data model. This is because a DGGS is like a uniform raster grid, but you can still often treat it like vector. Sets of cells can be collectively to represent objects. Each cell can have attributes associated with it, and these can still use rich data types like dates and text that are harder to achieve with raster data. Fundamentally, a DGGS provides a platform to unify data before efficiently doing analysis. It makes things analysis ready. One especially important property is that it's easy to extend any geospatial application or workflow built using a DGGS by simply indexing more data onto the same DGGS. There are other benefits too, um, and I won't talk about all of them now, but for now this idea of a hybrid, hybrid raster vector analysis ready data model is the key one I want to impress on you. So how, how can you get started with the DGGS? Um, at Manaki Fenil, we've made two tools available. One's called Raster to DGGS, the other's called Vector to DGGS. They're available on GitHub. They're not, they're not groundbreaking tools. We haven't written a lot of code. They simply wrap libraries that others have written into easy to install command line applications. And they're opinionated tools. That is, they uh, only write data to the open source Apache Parquet format. 
It takes some of the effort out of writing your own code to do this in a way that uses all available CPUs and correctly handles resampling. But they also present a simple API that I find useful when writing uh, reproducible scientific workflows in my, my day job. They're written in Python and they can be installed with a Python package index. They currently only work with one DGGS, that's the Uber H3 DGGS, but we are planning to add support for others, particularly one called uh, rhelpix, which is a very important DGGS because it has equal area cells. Uh, these cells uh, aren't equal area, which isn't always important, but often it is. Uh, this tool, raster to DGGS, uh, takes a raster, it's anything that can be read by GDAL, including things that are in cloud object storage, and writes the data out to DGGS cells. This will involve some resampling according to your target resolution. You can see three different resolutions here. Uh, it will store information about all the bands that are in the, in the raster data. Um, this example is, is reading a 10-band Sentinel-2 image. And the diagram shows three different band combinations that are uh, actually made in QGIS. Um, but it's actually reading from the DTGS cells rather than the original raster data. So those are cells not from a DTGS rather than from a raster format. Uh, this is what the output we just saw looks like if you were to read it as a data frame with a tool like Pandas. Each row has a H3 cell address as an index. That's actually a 64-bit integer in hexadecimal. And then the 10 bands from the Sentinel-2 image as attributes. You can control the resampling algorithm to get an appropriate lower resolution representation, like if you wanted to get the maximum value or the minimum or meaning or whatever it is. The other tool, vector to DGGS, is the same idea, but vector data. Converting a polygon to a set of DGGS cells that represent it is called polyfilling. You would need more or fewer cells to represent the same object uh, as you increase resolution or fidelity to the input. However, it is possible to compress the representation by exploiting the hierarchical nature of the DGGS. Because any seven sibling cells can be represented by their large parent cells, you need one reference to, to carry a reference for seven. Um, because we write data to a column oriented data store, which I'll return to in a moment, it's possible to simply write the data denormalized like this um, to make it a self contained expression of the original, but still achieve remarkable compression, typically much smaller than the input data. I said earlier that these tools are opinionated, and one of the opinions is that data is written to this Apache Parquet format. Apache Parquet is an open source, column-oriented data format designed for efficient data storage and retrieval. And the, the key bit there is column orientation. Column orientation means that the data for the same attributes are stored next to each other. So in an address of, in, in address of sorry, in a database of people, all of the names are stored adjacent to each other. Separately from that, all the phone numbers are stored adjacent. And then, uh, in contrast, a row-oriented database would, such as a relational database or even just a CSV, uh, stores the data for different attributes together, like one row per person. And there are trade-offs involved there. So it can be useful to have column-oriented data to query columns quickly. It's especially good when, for query performance when queries don't read all of the columns of your data, which, in my experience, is actually a common mode of uh, using data, spatial or not. You'd have, say, a condition for one or two attributes, and then you'd want to fetch all of the features that meet those at that attribute query, and then maybe just look at one or two of the different attributes that you need, ignoring all the others. Um, think about, for example, how you might, how those images of Sentinel-2 only use three of the 10 available bands. Um, yeah. So column-oriented data is efficient to compress because values in columns are often repeated. So for example, in row-oriented data, you wouldn't expect a, um, a row where the values forest, forest, forest appear in sequence for the attributes name, region, land cover class. But forest, forest, forest is exactly what you would expect if you're using a column orientation for the category column. So this makes compression very efficient because the similarity of adjacent data is what makes compression effective. However, column orientation is bad for inserting new data you can imagine how fast it is to append to a row-oriented database, like a CSV, you just append one more record onto the bottom. However, for, for a write-once, read-many case, column orientation is really an excellent fit, and you can be blown away by how much more efficient it is for querying. Uh, and in my work, in land use classification, um, it exactly fits this write-once, read-many pattern. 
because the input data is generally static rather than continuously updated and we don't want to change it. But it is read often because the classification logic is applied to every individual cell and the logic might be revised multiple times while we're working on it before the final product is acceptable. Parquet data also supports this idea of partitioning data on the basis of one or more columns. And a Rolodex is a good illustration of this idea of splitting a larger data set into, into organized pieces. So if you wanted to call someone called Zoe, you can go right to the Z file. That is, it's efficient to look up people when you know their names. But it wouldn't make sense to partition data by um, nu numerically sorted by phone numbers because um, you don't know the phone numbers in advance. So how you partition your data is, should match how you expect it to be queried. And since we expect spatial data to be queried spatially, it makes sense to perform a spatial partition, that is dividing our data into multiple non-overlapping regions. And hierarchical DGGS effectively gives you a space partitioning tree structure for free, even within database systems that do not have any understanding of the underlying spatial nature of our data. For example, look at this list partitioning on the left. This is using text to partition, but it is actually a form of spatial partitioning. And we can use DGGS cell IDs in the same fashion. So instead of a region, followed by the states within that region, we could use a coarser grandparent cell as the partition key, and under it would live all of the data that's indexed to its grandchild cells. But if you want to scan all of the data, you wouldn't expect partitioning to be particularly useful. However, what partitions do is make it a lot easier to perform parallel processing. So partitioning data removes the need to query the entire database, limiting each query to only scanning data within a single partition. Using different partitions enables concurrent access to the data set so you can scale horizontally. Uh, and because you can control partition size by picking an appropriate parent offset, you can avoid compute nodes becoming overloaded by controlling the maximum amount of computation they each have to do. But the requirement for that, exporting that pattern of partitioning is that each partition has to be independent. So if you're doing sort of raster algebra style overlay calculations, that's fine. If you're doing dynamic proximity queries that might need to reach across partition boundaries, then it's not. So not a fit for everything, but when it can work, it's very effective. Here's a, uh, a GIF of a land use map that we made, it's loading. It's actually loading from a partitioned table in Postgres. And the partition keys are H3 indexes, grandparent cell IDs. And Q just loads them progressively, rendering them according to their partitions. So you can sort of see a vague sort of hexagon loading and then all of its chi children will load and then it'll move on to the next parent and so on. And that's just subtly revealing the underlying structure of how the data is organized. Now I said at the beginning that I'm not gonna focus on land use mapping, um, but land use mapping was the catalyst for me exploring DGGS and getting interested in column-oriented formats and partitioning data because land use mapping demands an extremely broad and, and heterogeneous suite of input data, both physical and human, static and dynamic, raster and vector. A DGGS is an excellent basis for the kind of combinatorial analysis that you have to do to make a map like this. Um, but I think the idea of a DGGS and column-orienting data is broadly applicable to many problems in GIS and I encourage you to try them out using our tools if they're new concepts for you. There are many resources, resources available online and I'll be more than happy to talk to you about these ideas as well. Um, just to finish up, these are some closer views of that land use map that we've made. It's actually a classification according to the Australian Land Use and Management Classification System, version eight, applied to all of Northland. Each cell is given a class, but also other attributes like commodities, what crops are grown, what animals are grazed, and management practices and forms of provenance information. But because it's presented on the standard grid, it's also very fast to spatially relate new information to the data simply by using the same DGGS cell IDs as a reference. If we go closer again, we can see now the hexagon shapes start to emerge. Um, these cells have an area of about 40 meters squared. And in these maps, um, they've been aggregated in contigu into contiguous blocks. And you can see the attributes there according to the land use schema. So it's, again, uniform like a raster grid, but has this rich attributes like vector data that you're familiar with. So you're getting the best of both worlds. So um, I hope that I've introduced you all right to the idea of a DGGS without being too scary. Um, again, just to recap, I think it's 
most fruitful to think about it as a hybrid raster vector data for geospatial information. Um, those are the names of the tools you can try out there on GitHub. And I just want to quickly say thanks to all of the open source software developers out there. You, you literally make my job not just possible, but rather delightful. And I also want to thank James Ardo over there, who's at the conference. Um, he's put a lot of effort into these ideas and also these DGGS conversion tools specifically. So thank you very much. Okay, we've got an opportunity to ask uh, Richard some questions. So um, raise your hand and uh, a microphone will be brought round to you and we'll go from there. Hi, thanks. That was really fascinating and new way of thinking about data. Um, this might be a stupid question, but what advantages does that system offer over a set of rectangular polygons that match one of the rasters with all the attributes attached? First of all, no such thing as a stupid question. That's an important philosophy I hold. Um, the advantage is effectively stable IDs over time. Um, so your arbitrary grid that you've created, you're effectively a fishnet. That's fine. It, some of the benefits will be the same. The disbenefit is that no one else is going to make the same arbitrary choice of grid, effectively. So, so you can make data, you can publish it, and then someone else you've never met, you'll never meet, never heard of, can also publish to the exact same grid and be interoperable. And that's part of that fair data principles or interoperability. I've been doing some work over the past year or so on econometrics of cattle stations. And I'm just wondering, listen to your presentation, which I loved, by the way, and I think I first heard about this last time I was at a physical FOS 4G in Wellington four years ago before the apocalypse. But um, uh, yeah, it's just such a fascinating concept and, and looks really useful. But I'm just wondering for my use case how I would actually use it. Like, and I would definitely do the type of work that you're doing. So I'm looking at land types and aggregating areas and making weighted sums across areas and that kind of thing. Um, if I have a bunch of paddock line work or something like that, how do I get these boundaries? And if that line work is changing and that's the whole purpose of my application, is that then a bad fit for this? Or so when you say line work, paddock line work? So paddock line work, like fences essentially. Mm -hmm. So part of the tool that I've built is an interactive design surface for cattle stations. So you kind of put fences in and see what it would do in terms of watering areas and that kind of thing. Um, so you're sort of modelling on grid? like uh, It's just modelling with polygonal um, analysis with, uh, at the moment with um, spatial light, actually. Um, yeah. uh, so I've using, the, using the, deep, the, the sort of ST, uh, the, the standard features, uh, mm -hmm. relational operators on, on spatial light, yeah. Right, so yeah, okay, that's good. So the, standard, the spatial operations, the kind of um, you know intersect, overlay, difference, union kind of stuff. Exactly. The, I didn't get into too much in this talk, but um, one of the cool benefits of using a DTGS is you get these cell IDs, they're just integers. If you've got the same integer, you have the same cell. The computer doesn't have to know anything about the spatial reference system, doesn't need to know its spatial data at all. If you've got one set of numbers here, one set of numbers here, and they're all different, they don't spatially intersect. So a lot of these traditional geometric calculations that you do in GIS that are very computationally expensive boil down to set theory and mathematics, which computers are very, very good at. So a lot of these operations you can do in very simple code um, and effectively doing GIS without a GIS. So that's you probably benefit from that idea, but um, maybe you could talk more in the break about your particular use case. I think because I'm not quite yeah, sure. Yeah, actually, love to. I think I'm, I think I've kind of got an idea what you mean, but I, yeah. I have more questions for sure. Cool. Thank you. Great talk. Right. I don't think there's any more questions. Oh, one more. There's one more question. I was just kind of curious. Does it make sense to go from DGGS back to say vector? You, you can, you, you, you can, and we do. Um, so people are put off by looking at weird hexagons when they've used to their property boundaries. You simply store a reference to the original feature ID and its cells. If you want to go back to the original geometry, just join it back and express it as a geometry again. And we do that in this in the land use maps. We produce that parcel scale, and we simply go, what is the um, the most common class within this parcel? We'll assign that to the parcel bring it back into parcel geometries and forget that the DGGS ever happened. It can remain in implementation detail.
Bro, thank you very much.